So in this video, I'll be going over some of the NFL controversial topics and you know some question marks going into the 2020 offseason. There's a lot of things. I think I have 10 things listed here. I might not do one of them, so it might be nine things. My apologies, but it might take a while. So we have a lot of questions about different quarterbacks. Where will it be next year? Of course, Tom Brady, Phillip Rivers, Mitch Trubisky maybe, Jameis Winston, Marcus Mariota. Maybe someone else I'm forgetting. And some other questions. Does Odell Beckham get traded? Does Dak Prescott or Amari Cooper get re-signed by the Cowboys? Or do they go elsewhere? Um, maybe some new coaches. And, you know, do I think they'll succeed or not? And even Super Bowl 54, obviously. So we'll get into all that. This might be a long video, but we'll see. So hopefully you guys enjoy. If you want me to do videos like this in the future about other NFL topics, then let me know. And I'll gladly do so. So hopefully you guys enjoy this. And let's get into it. So we will start with the Carolina Panthers and their quarterback situation heading into 2020. So Cam Newton had that Liz Frank surgery on his foot and basically missed the entire season. He missed 14 games of the 2019 season. He missed the final two games of the 2018 season with the shoulder injury. And Kyle Allen came in, the former undrafted free agent, started 12 games going 5-7. and seven. It started off nicely. I think he started off like four and two maybe off the top of my head or something like that it started off pretty nicely and some people were talking about oh maybe Kyle Allen's the future here but then all of a sudden he started playing very poorly Will Greer came in for him played even worse and then the Panthers are in a situation now where it's like it's Cam Newton or we draft a new guy so Allen definitely had his ups and downs I talked about that and Cam Newton's contract right now he still has um, one year remaining on his five-year deal and since he signed it five years ago, it's a pretty generous contract, especially for a quarterback for Cam Newton. So he's slated to make $21 million next season. You have quarterbacks, like I wrote down here, I mean, Derek Carr, Jared Goff, Kirk Cousins, guys like that making more than Cam Newton next season, which is pretty crazy. So $21 million for a presumably healthy Cam Newton is a great deal, a very team-friendly deal as well. So that alone, you know, a healthy Cam Newton making $20 million should be enough to want to take him back. But of course, it all depends on his medical records, which I don't have in front of me, obviously. That's up to the Panthers and their team doctors and whatnot. But if Cam Newton's healthy, I think it makes all the sense in the world to bring him back. Um, I think he comes back to finish out that last year on his contract, and we'll see what happens next year, obviously. Um, maybe the new head coach, Matt Rule, wants his own guy. That's definitely understandable, but Cam Newton has been the face of the Panthers for basically a decade now, so I mean, I know he's had some injuries, he's had his ups and downs, but he's also had some really bright moments as well, so let's not forget, even in 2018, the first half of 2018, which is just two years ago, not even, Cam Newton was the runner-up for the MVP award. I mean, of course, Patrick Mahomes had the 52 touchdown year. He was running away with it but Cam Newton was right behind him at one point the Panthers started off six and two Cam Newton got that injury on Thursday night football in Pittsburgh and ever since then his season kind of declined and of course he was playing hurt the whole time but before that he was the obvious runner-up for MVP so Cam Newton when he's healthy still a very good quarterback only slated to make 20 mil 21 million dollars next year I think it makes a lot of sense to bring him back so that's what I'm predicting I think Cam Newton is still the quarterback for the Panthers for at least one more year so it was reported recently that the LA Chargers are quote-unquote moving on from Phillip Rivers after 16 seasons in San Diego and some in LA. Rivers is currently 38 years old, coming off one of the worst seasons of his NFL career, and you could attribute that to some of his offensive line being injured. I know his left tackle and center were out most of the year, but something just didn't look right about Phillip Rivers last year. He was just rushing things. He just wasn't making smart decisions anymore, and I know he had an offensive coordinator change in the middle of the year as well, so there's a few things that went against him but really 20 20 interceptions is a lot so you have to take that into account obviously of course you know he's at the age now where he should not be making rookie mistakes but here we are so it's also reported that Philip Rivers moved his family from San Diego to Florida that was pretty recent I mean it was like a low-key thing at first but then once the media got a hold of it of course everybody knew about it so this could open things up for Rivers playing in Tampa Bay. I think we all know that, uh, know that at this point. And Tennessee is also an option. I mean, Phillip Rivers has said in the past that he would love to play for the Titans. He grew up less than two hours away from where the Titans play, so that's definitely an option. But, of course, now they have the emergence of Ryan Tannehill. So after Marcus Mariota was benched, people were thinking, oh, Phillip Rivers in Tennessee would be a great fit. But, of course, Ryan Tannehill just comes in. I wouldn't say led them to the AFC Championship, but was a big reason why they were there. I mean, you can't forget the regular season he had the you know last seven eight games of the year he was terrific so you can't forget that obviously they had to make the playoffs of course and Tannehill was a big part of that so Tennessee I mean it could be an option but we'll see I mean Ryan Tannehill's a free agent as well so we will definitely see if he's resigned there or not 
And if I had to guess right now, I would say Phillip Rivers will probably be a Buccaneer next season, which is very surprising. I can't really envision him in a Buccaneers jersey, but you never know. Um, head coach Bruce Arians was not too pleased with Jameis Winston. We'll get into that later when we talk about Jameis. So it would not be shocking if there was a vacancy at quarterback for the Tampa Bay, uh, Tampa Bay Buccaneers. So Tampa Bay is a very appealing spot for any quarterback with Bruce Arians and his history with quarterbacks. Of course, you think about Carson Palmer, I think even Andrew Luck at one point as well. So he has that. That going for him, you know, the vertical passing offense, which is great for quarterbacks. You have Mike Evans, Chris Godwin, even Brashad um, Perriman ended up having a nice year at the end of the year. So, I mean, there's a lot of receivers there. Even O.J. Howard, if he gets his stuff together finally, maybe he gets traded. I don't know, but there's a lot of good options there. The offensive line for Tampa is iffy. It's not great. I mean, their run blocking was terrible. We know that. Their pass blocking was, I guess... A little below average. I w- I'll leave it at that. So they might need to improve the line if a guy like Rivers is there, but it's definitely a very appealing spot for a quarterback. So I think the one dark horse team for Rivers, if somehow the Raiders get rid of Derek Carr and get someone to take his massive contract, I think um, the, what do we call them now, the Las Vegas Raiders when, might be a place for Phillip Rivers next year. So we'll see what happens. I mean, I think the most likely spot for him right now, based off where he moved his family, is Tampa. I think Bruce Arians and Phillip Rivers would get along. They're both old school type of guys, so we'll see what happens. And it'll be interesting. I think Rivers is, you know, the type of guy that's not going to, you know, I didn't want to say that, but I think he'll be a guy that's like willing to be a, a backup quarterback. I mean, he might be in a situation where like, you know, maybe he does go to Tennessee and maybe they tell him at first, you'll be a bench player, but if Ryan Tannehill slips up, you'll have a chance. So I don't think like Rivers is going to not sign if he's not a starter. I think he'll go anywhere and be a backup. He still wants to play, obviously. So we'll see how this plays out, but I think there might be an opening spot in Tampa Bay. So that's where I'm going to say Philip Rivers goes for 2020. Number three, where will Tom Brady play in 2020? I cannot believe we're even talking about this. So Tom uh, Tom Brady is a free agent for the first time, at least that I can remember. This might be the first time ever, honestly. He's been a Patriot since 2000 when they drafted him. And honestly, I don't see that changing. I know this is like a boring answer, but I don't think he's leaving. So I can't envision him playing anywhere else, kind of like Phillip Rivers. I mean, we've seen him in one jersey for 16 years. We've seen Brady in one jersey for like 19 or 20 years now. So I can't really see him moving on from New England at it doesn't make much sense for them either. I mean, their backup quarterback is Jarrett Stidham, who's honestly not that impressive. I think he came in last year, like, threw a pick six or something against the Jets. So uh, I remember I bet on the Patriots that game, so it pissed me off. So I do remember that. But anyway, um, so it doesn't really make sense for them. There's not really anyone in free agency that you can replace Brady with that would make a lot of sense. I mean, in the off chance that Drew Brees leaves New Orleans to join the New England Patriots, that's like the one thing I can see. I cannot see um, Bill Belichick putting up with Jameis Winston and his turnovers, so I don't see that happening as well. And look, there's this crazy scenario, and I don't even want to say this because it sounds ridiculous, but there's a crazy scenario where maybe the Patriots do move on from Brady, start Jarrett Stidham for a whole year, and just completely tank, and then try to get Trevor Lawrence in 2021. I mean, it's not like the most ridiculous thing in the world, and I kind of feel stupid saying it, but like imagine going from Tom Brady for 20 years, and then on to Trevor Lawrence for another 15 or 20 years. I mean, that would be an awesome move, and it's definitely tough to sell that to your football team and your fans to completely suck for five or six months during an NFL season, but if you think about it and you can just simulate from a year from now, it's not a bad move. So I don't see it happening. I mean, teams don't openly tank in the NFL too much. I mean, the Dolphins come to mind after trading like Minka Fitzpatrick and Laramie Tunsil, but you don't see it too much in the NFL. So I don't think a team like the Patriots and especially Bill Belichick at the age he's at now, I don't think he wants to completely tank, but you never know. I mean, they're you know the evil geniuses for a reason. So we'll see. But I do think Tom Brady will be back in 2020. I can't really see him playing anywhere else. I think if he was to move on somewhere, I can see him going to LA and playing for the Chargers. That's like the one place I can see him playing. I mean, the Chargers, as we know, don't have too many fans in LA, so that would definitely sell some tickets if you bring the quote-unquote GOAT to LA. I think that would sell some tickets and maybe give the Chargers some bandwagon fans, however you want to say it. And the Chargers have a pretty good roster. I mean, their offensive line isn't great, as I said before, but it wouldn't be a bad roster for Brady. But if I had to put money on it, I would say Brady returns to the Patriots for 2020. Number four, will Odell Beckham Jr. be one and done with the Cleveland Browns? So I'm sure we've all seen this by now, whether you want to believe it or not, but there was the report coming out that Odell Beckham would say to teams after playing them, come get me, basically saying like, you know, get me out of here and let me come play for your team. And I don't think there's any way to prove that. I don't think he was like mic'd up or anything. It might have been released, but I never saw it. So, I mean, this is just reports and rumors, so I don't really know if I believe them, but I could see Odell saying that. It's something he would say for sure, so I could definitely believe it, but we'll I don't know. 
Um, so whatever you want to believe about Odell or not, he definitely had an underwhelming year last year. I think he still put up decent numbers based off him playing injured the entire year and being in an offense ran by Freddie Kitchens that was pretty terrible. So he still had 74 receptions over 1,000 yards, only four touchdowns, which is very low for him. And, you know, if that's considered a quote-unquote down year, that's still pretty good. I mean, that's better than most receivers, honestly. So Odell still has his monster contract that he signed with the Giants in 2018. So if you're going to, if you're Cleveland, it's going to be hard to trade him, especially off a year like that. So he does have the injury concerns. I think he played all 16 games last year, which is nice, but he did have that core injury since August and he played all season through it. So credits to him for being uh, tough and all that and playing through it. But at the same time, his numbers weren't too impressive either way. I know Baker Mayfield had an off year. I know the Browns offensive line was terrible. And as I mentioned before, I think Freddie Kitchens was a bigger problem than people uh, realize. So I do ultimately think he stays in Cleveland in 2020. I kind of want to see him go to a local team like the Jets. I loved having Odell in the New York area. I think it's so fun because he's just one of those guys that like just brings so much attention to himself and stuff like that. And, you know, I'm sure the media loves having a guy like that and all the storylines. And there's a lot of fake articles written about him. So it sucks for and you know, for him in that perspective, but for the most part, having a, a personality like Odell here was pretty fun, honestly. And if it's not for my team and you can put the distraction on the Jets or something like that, then that's great. Have that happen. So, um, where are we at now? So I'm a big fan of Kevin Stefanski, the new head coach of the Browns. I'm sure he'll be calling the plays. And I do think Freddie Kitchens was terrible. The offensive line was terrible. Baker Mayfield could have been better. So I think they got one of their big problems out the door being Freddie Kitchens, no pun intended, you know, big problem. But anyway, um, I think the offensive line, I mean, they need to improve that as well. Maybe they draft a couple guys. Maybe they make a, a free agent signing. So we'll see. I mean, I think the Browns could fix this. I think I think this is fixable. And if the Browns just, just had an offensive line and a better play caller, I think this offense would be a lot better. Their defense, I don't think, was too atrocious last year by any means. You still have some talented defenders there as well. So I'm excited for the Browns in 2020. I know I said it last year, and I did have them as a wild card team in 2019 and honestly they probably should have been they've blown so many games this year it was ridiculous I think they lost to like the Broncos one game with some quarterback I never heard of like Brendan Allen or something his name was I don't know and they lost a couple other games that were terrible but yeah the Browns should be better I like Kevin Stefanski a lot I think he's a good offensive mind he gave Kirk Cousins the best year of his career and you know he was very safe with the football didn't turn the ball over much I think that'll benefit Baker Mayfield a lot in 2020 so I think the Browns will be a lot better and I think Odell Beckham ultimately stays in Cleveland for 2020. Number five, do the Bears move on from Mitch Trubisky? So after taking a step back in year three, some people believe it's time to move on and have a new Bears quarterback in 2020. So do I personally believe that Trubisky is the future and the answer for the Bears at quarterback? No, but I do believe he will be the week one starter in 2020. I don't think they're ready to move on just yet. Don't forget how much they gave up for this guy to move up. I mean, they moved up in the draft. I think it was like one or two spots or no, maybe it was more. I forget, but it was they moved up in the draft to get him, obviously. And they gave up a ton of picks for him. So I think to give up on this guy after three years would not be the right move. I mean, honestly, Mitch had a pretty rough rookie year. Had a pretty good year too. Seemed like things were going in the right direction. You know, they were excited with the Matt Nagy offense and stuff like that. And then year three took a step back. And part of that had to do with the defense. The defense wasn't as good as it was in 2018. But as I always say, number one defenses rarely replicate. It's hard to have a number one defense twice in a row. And of course, there's bound to be a regression from a defense. And the Bears, while they were still a really good defense, were not the number one defense in the league. So that was, you know, it's it's to be expected, honestly. So. The Bears could surprise us all and make a uh, an offer for like Jameis Winston, but I don't see that happening, honestly. I think what's going to happen is Trubisky will be the starter next year. And honestly, some people say, you know, might say like just cut the guy, but I looked at his contract and he's due to make $9 million next year, but if they cut him, it's $9 million in dead cap space. So it literally would make no sense and have no benefit to cut him whatsoever. You're saving no money and you're just putting yourself in a $9 million hole to have a a no spot on your roster basically so on the bright side Trubisky looked a lot better in the second half of 2019 so maybe he can build off of that he had some better performances so there's that and you know I do think the Bears might bring in some competition for him I don't think this is Trubisky's job all alone next year I think he'll have a legitimate you know competitor at quarterback and I do have a guy listed later that we'll talk about 
Um, I'm not going to spoil it yet, but I think another guy that might bring in is like a Josh Rosen type of guy, someone who failed on two teams. I think Rosen's still 22 years old. Of course, if you guys watch me, you know I loved Rosen in college. I think if he went to the right team, he'd still be fine as a quarterback, but we'll see. I mean, they might bring in some competition for him. I'd be very surprised if they had no leg- uh, legitimate backup. I don't think Chase Daniels is a legitimate threat to his job. Of course, they named him the starter for a little bit last year, but it did not last. So I think they bring in a guy like a Rosen or, a, you know, the guy I'll talk about later, but I'm I'm sure some of you guys can guess who it is because I think it's a really good fit, but we'll get into that later. So uh, for Mitch Trubisky, I do think he's the starter next year. I think week one, 2020, we will see Mitch Trubisky under center for the Chicago Bears. Number six, what do the Dallas Cowboys do with Amari Cooper and Dak Prescott? So for Dak Prescott, he's an unrestricted free agent coming off his rookie contract. Same with Amari Cooper. And I'd be very surprised if he was not with Dallas next season. So I think for him, it's either a franchise tag or they sign him to that long extension that, you know, they were working on during the season. And Dak did finish second in the NFL in passing yards, and I know that's not the best, you know, uh, stats to prove if a quarterback is good or not, but he definitely took strides in the right direction, so I give Dak Prescott some credit there. I think Kellen Moore had a lot to do with um, the development as well and the play calling and stuff like that. So, of course, you know, his first full season with Amari Cooper is definitely going to help as well. Guys like Michael Gallup got better, so yeah, it definitely helps a guy like Prescott. So, if he is franchise tagged, I think the franchise tag for a quarterback is around like $25 million. So it would not be a long-term commitment for Dallas. Obviously, that'd be a one-year commitment just to keep him on the roster. Um, he might not like that, but still $25 million for one year at the quarterback position where it's very rare to have a career-ending injury. I think Dak Prescott would take that and probably try to prove himself once again. So it was reported during the year that they offered him a $30 million contract per year, probably for like you know five years or so, but Dak turned it down and he's looking for for a $40 million per year contract. So maybe they meet in the middle around like 35 and they set on like a five-year $35 million per year type of deal, but we'll see. As for Amari Cooper, his rookie contract's up as well. Of course, drafted by the Raiders, traded to the Cowboys, and he's an unrestricted free agent. So I think both players will be with Dallas next year. Again, I don't think um, Jerry Jones will let those guys go. And somehow the Cowboys have $80 million in cap space. It makes no sense to me because they have such a talented roster. They're paying Demarcus Lawrence now a ton of money. I don't know how they have $80 million in cap space. Even Ezekiel Elliott got a big contract as well. So... I don't see how they have that much money, but I'm not going to ask questions there. But I do think uh, both guys will be back. I don't see either of those guys departing, honestly. I don't think Jerry Jones lets that happen. I think uh, Amari Cooper might be better in a different spot. Maybe you put him on a different team. He might have better numbers. But still, I think Amari and Dak have a pretty good connection for the most part. So I I don't think he leaves. And I think it's more likely that Cooper gets the long-term deal. I think it would be easier for him. Maybe Cooper gets something between like fifteen, eighteen million dollars annually. Give him like a four or five year deal. He's still pretty young as well, so I think you know he's probably in his mid twenties. So both guys are young here. I think Dak might be a little bit more fussy on the financial side. So I'm not sure they'll get something done. It would not surprise me if they got something done right before the year started. But he might play on a fran- uh, franchise tag as well. So I think both guys end up staying in Dallas. My prediction is that Cooper gets the long-term deal because obviously you can't franchise two guys I, unless they change the rule, but that's that used to be the case. I don't think you could franchise two guys. You um, franchise Dak Prescott and then you sign a Mark Cooper for the multi-year deal. I think that's how it'll play out in Dallas. Number seven, where will Jameis Winston play in 2020? So I've brought up his name a couple times so far, and honestly, he's a very interesting case because he's 26 years old, coming off his rookie deal. He has upside that's through the ceiling, but he has a downside that's through the floor. And I mean, it's just ridiculous. I mean, he had the most interesting and bizarre season I've ever seen by a quarterback. And I've been watching football. I'm not going to make it sound like I've been watching for 40 years. I think I've been watching probably since 2005 or so. But still, I mean, this is like the craziest year I've seen from a quarterback. He led the NFL in turnovers, but also led the league in passing yards. His season ended on a pick six in overtime to the Falcons. I mean, that was the perfect ending for a Jameis Winston season right there. He's an unrestricted free agent, and the Bucks have yet to make any commitment to him. I mean, there were reports like around Christmas time that they're expecting him to re-sign with the Bucks, but then you haven't heard anything about it. So I'm not really sure where they stand right now. There's been nothing really said about it. And Bruce Arians had that very negative or, you know, kind of threw some shade at Jameis Winston with that quote. And he said, if we can win with this quarterback, meaning Jameis, I think we can win with another one too. So, I mean, that was a pretty savage quote right there. But Bruce Arians, as I said, he's an old school guy. He's not afraid to speak his mind. I do like Bruce Arians. I think he has a good track record. It speaks for itself. But Jameis did have a lot of negative plays. But in his words, he thinks he was balling in the 2019 season. So I saw the quote and I think, you know, some reporter asked him about his season. He's like, oh, you see my numbers on 
Lonzon Ball, and I'm like, oh, okay. I mean, we're not going to talk about the turnovers, I guess. But, yeah, if you look at his passing yards, his touchdowns, and take away the negative stats, yeah, he was balling. He had a pretty good year. But, of course, turnovers kill you and they lose games. So, um, I like Arians, and I mean, I think, you know, he wants to go in another uh, direction with a, with a quarterback. I think if he really wanted Jameis Winston back, he would not have taken that shot at Jameis and say, you know, if we can win with this quarterback, we could probably win with another one, too. That's, like, not something you would say if you want a guy back. So, I think he's probably, I think if it's up to Arians, he would want a new quarterback, and I do think he ultimately gets his way. I'm sure Jameis is out seeking, like, a five-year mega deal where he's making, like, $35 million a year. I don't think a team's going to give him that, and I think it'll, it'll come down to him getting a one-year prove-it deal, and that's a hot take because, and this is a former first overall pick, he's 26 years old, led the league in passing yards, as I said, his upside is through the roof, so of course his downside's pretty bad as well. But with that being said, I think Jameis Winston will be a Los Angeles Charger on a one-year deal next year, probably one year, maybe $20 million. I mean, we'll see if they can afford that. I'm sure they can with Phillip Rivers being gone now, so uh, Jameis, I mean, you're only 26 years old, and he's probably not going to get the money he feels he deserves in this market. I don't think there's many teams out here that are going to chase Jameis Winston. I really don't see that happening. So maybe the Bears are a surprise team that makes a run for him. Maybe the Colts are a surprise team, but I don't see many teams trying to chase him, honestly. It would be very surprising to me. So I don't think he'll accept anything uh, long-term if he doesn't feel the money is right. So he might take that one year, twenty twenty five million dollar deal, and try to just prove himself one more year with the Chargers. I think the Chargers, as I said, have a pretty good team. They have some good receivers there as well. If Keenan Allen, Mike Williams, Hunter Henry, hopefully back and healthy, so they have good receivers there. The offensive line, as I said, needs some work. But Jameis Winston's the type of guy that doesn't need as a, an offensive line like Philip Rivers does. I mean, Jameis Winston can get out of a lot of sticky situations and stuff like that. So he's good at eluding the rush sometimes. And I think if, uh, for the Chargers, it'd be perfect to draft a guy like Justin Herbert sixth overall um, have him sit on the bench for a full year learn some stuff learn the good stuff from Jameis Winston don't learn all of it but learn the good stuff from Jameis Winston and then have Justin Herbert start the next year hopefully for Jameis's sake he plays well in 2020 and then can get the big contract he's seeking in the next offseason so we'll see I mean I don't think there's enough teams right now there are like five or six teams that kind of like want quarterbacks and need quarterbacks some more than others but I don't see a team throwing 35 million dollars a year for a guy who led the league in turnovers by a lot so I just don't see that happening honestly and I think you know this scenario is kind of crazy it's a bit hot takey you know having a Jameis Winston type quarterback who's 26 on a one-year deal going to Los Angeles to play for the Chargers but at the same time in my head I think it makes sense so I doubt it happens we'll see I think it does make sense in a way but I do think Jameis Winston ends up on a one-year deal going to the Los Angeles Chargers. Number eight, and he's actually number eight. I didn't do that on purpose, but that was just an accident. Just a coincidence. Marcus Mariota, where will he play in 2020? So this man was selected right after Jameis in the 2015 draft, and now both guys are in somewhat similar situations, probably not going to resign with their team. That's pretty crazy, honestly. Like, if you told me in 2015, like, neither Jameis Winston or Marcus Mariota will be back with their teams in the 2020 season, I'd be like, whoa, that's pretty crazy. So here we are. We might be in that reality right now in a few months when these guys actually picked their team so I would be shocked if he landed a starting job somewhere I just can't think of anywhere for him to start right now it would make no, no sense to me I can't see being an NFL GM being like you know who I want as my starter Marcus Mariota like I just cannot see that happening unless there's like an injury and he has to start but like I don't see that being like your number one option right now so I alluded to this before. Actually, no, I did not actually. I typed it out, but I didn't say it. I do think Mariota would be a very nice fit for the Chicago Bears. I talked about Josh Rosen being a backup, but I think Marcus Mariota would be a great backup for the Chicago Bears. And the, the narrative is great here. So think about this narrative. So Mitch Trubisky and Marcus Mariota, former second overall picks. This time you have Mitch Trubisky. Let's say he has another down year, right? Then you have Marcus Mariota come in, save the day, maybe leads the Bears to the playoffs, kind of like Ryan Tannehill did to him. Like, he'll Ryan Tannehill. He'll Ryan Tannehill, Mitch Trubisky is what I'm trying to say. It's hard to think of all these names. But, yes, he has a chance to do that. And maybe... Maybe Mitch Trubisky has another terrible year, and Mariota takes over for him in the middle of the 2020 season. Maybe Mariota puts on a great performance and leads them to the playoffs, and maybe they go to the NFC Championship game. Maybe he has this Ryan Tannehill type of reviving his career type of thing going on here. So it's possible. I mean, it's probably unlikely, but it's it's not impossible. 
So this narrative works very well for Mariota, and I think he would work well in the type of offense that Matt Nagy runs. I think Trubisky and Mariota are somewhat similar of quarterbacks. They're not exactly the same, but I think, you know, they have the same type of mobility. They have, like, you know, I think Mariota is a little more accurate, but, you know, I think Mitch Trubisky might be better on a deep ball by a little bit. So they're somewhat similar, though, those guys. I think both can run the Matt Nagy system pretty well. I mean, I don't want to say too well, but, you know, they can both run the system, obviously. So... I think other teams could be in play for a guy like Mariota. I mean, as a backup quarterback, of course, I think the Broncos are an option, the backup Drew Locke, and then maybe the Colts to drag, uh, to back up uh, Jacoby Brissett. You know, he got injured last year, I believe, so maybe, you know, they want to bring in some insurance for him. I'm sure Mariota won't cost a lot, so it's a cost-effective move, and, you know, he's a guy who might be good. I mean, you never know. Marcus Mariota had, I think, maybe a couple decent years in the NFL, never really broke out like we expected him to, but he's the type of quarterback that he'll take care of the ball. He won't take too many risks, and if you put him with a really good defense like the Bears have, then maybe he has a decent year as a starting quarterback, and if Mitch Trubisky slips up, then you put Mariota in because Matt Nagy was definitely looking to move on from Trubisky last year. I mean, he put in freaking Chase Daniel to start a couple games last year, so if you have Mariota, who's still probably in his mid-20s as well, you have him, maybe he he somehow just has a great year. I mean, you never know. So, I mean, we None of us expected Ryan Tannehill to do what he did, so maybe Marcus Mariota can do the same next year for the Chicago Bears. I think, I think that'd be a nice fit, but I also think there's other options. I said Josh Rosen before. I don't know who else there would be. Teddy Bridgewater, maybe. I don't know. But, you know, there might be other options for the Bears, but I think Marcus Mariota, for him personally, the Chicago Bears would be a great fit in 2020. Number 10, Super Bowl 54 prediction. So I did skip number 9. That was about the new head coaches, and honestly, I feel like that would take a long time, so I'll do that in a different video if you guys want. So if you watched my NFL prediction video back in August, you know that I picked the Chiefs to win the Super Bowl. I did have them play in the Eagles, so I am half wrong, very wrong, but um, the Eagles did make the playoffs, but they had a pretty bad year, honestly. So Anyway, the San Francisco 49ers, 13-3 this year. The Chiefs were 12-4. Both teams had a first-round bye. The Chiefs trailed by 24 in their first divisional matchup. They somehow came back and won that game by 20-something points. It was the craziest game I've ever seen, probably, honestly. It was just ridiculous. I mean, they were down 24 nothing and led the game at halftime somehow. It made no sense whatsoever. Bill O'Brien should have been fired for that fake punt, but I'm not getting into that. I can't stand Bill O'Brien, honestly. I can't believe he got the GM role. That's another thing I should talk about, but it's ridiculous. Anyway. Um, so they came back from a 10-0 deficit against the Titans, I believe, as well. They went on to make the Super Bowl, obviously. They made, you know, it, I mean, the Titans gave them a decent battle, but it wasn't anything great. So, I mean, the Chiefs had control of that game for the most part, especially in the second half. The Niners, they made quick work of the Vikings. The Vikings had no chance offensively. The Niners' defense was too good. I think they won that game 27-10. to They had, like, a late touchdown, so, I mean, it's whatever. And then against the Packers, they ran for, like, 500 yards. It felt like Raheem Mostart had a great game, like, three touchdowns, 200-something yards. I, you know, I felt really good for him because he was cut by many teams and kind of like came out of nowhere. So it's good to see that from him. And um, I did mention I picked the Chiefs back in August to win this Super Bowl. But now I'm leaning towards the 49ers. And I don't know. I just feel better about them right now. The Chiefs right now are one and a half point favorites in the Super Bowl. So it's a very close matchup according to Vegas. I personally bet on the 49ers already. So I'm kind of rooting for them to win this, obviously. Both teams were top six in offensive yards per game. They were top five offensively in points per game. So these are very good offenses, as we know. And of course, you can have Garoppolo and Mahomes now. Before I get into Garoppolo, people were, you know, really just crapping on Garoppolo for no reason in the preseason. I mean, he had that like, one bad week of practice or one bad day of practice where he threw like four interceptions and like people in media were all over him. People on Twitter were all over him. And then we had that preseason game against the Broncos, I think it was, where Garoppolo had like one series through an interception, looked bad. And people were like, oh, he's such a waste of money. So I literally made a video back in, like, August coming on to defend Jimmy Garoppolo because I'm like, oh my gosh, he's not that bad of a quarterback. Like, I've watched – I made a video about Garoppolo at the end of the 2017 season, so I watched, like, every throw of his. And I'm like, this guy's pretty good. Like, he knows how to work the middle of the field. He's accurate, has good footwork and stuff like that. So I was a fan of Garoppolo. I mean, he wasn't going to be, like, anything fantastic, but I think he's a pretty good quarterback. He's very – um as I said, accurate, does a lot of nice things, and I think, you know, he's a above-average quarterback in his league, so when I saw people, like, just overreacting because of some practice reports, I was like, whoa, whoa, I mean, this guy's still a good quarterback, come on now, so I came to his defense there, and I'm happy I did, because he ended up having a great year, so, 
I think what they're going to try and do the Niners, they're going to try and run the ball in the beginning of the game, give them a heavy dose of Raheem Mostart, Matt Breda, Tevin Coleman if he plays, you know, Jeff Wilson, whatever that guy's name is, Kyle Juszczyk. They have a bunch of running backs on this team or slash fullbacks, you want to call them. And I think Mahomes against the Niners' pass defense is the most intriguing matchup of this game, of course. And the Niners' pass defense, I think, was the best unit um, against passing yards this year per game. So, of course, that's going to be a fun matchup to watch. I mean, Mahomes is probably the best quarterback in football right now. I think they're going to try and double-team Tyreek Hill most of the game. They're going to try and make someone else beat them. Uh, San Francisco has some athletic linebackers. They have Quan Alexander, Fred Warner, athletic linebackers that can probably stick with Travis Kelsey better than most teams can. I mean, I don't think you can completely shut him down, but they can probably stick with him better than most teams will. I think they'll have a good game plan against him. So I think for the Chiefs, it'll be up to guys like Sammy Watkins or Demarcus Robinson to try and make things happen for the Chiefs offense. And that definitely could happen. I think I also bet on Demarcus Robinson having a uh, anytime touchdown. So hopefully that happens for me. But um, I do think the Niners win this game. I really do. I mean, I think I had the final score at 31-27 Niners. I think that'd be a good game. I think we'll be in a situation where Mahomes has the ball trying to win the game at the end. I think the Niners get that stop, and I think the Niners end up winning their, what would it be, their fifth Super Bowl? I think I wrote it down somewhere. What would it be? Um, where did I write it? Oh, there's six. Yeah, there's six Super Bowl. That's a lot. Wow. So congrats to the Niners if they win their six Super Bowl. That's a ton. So that would be cool. I do feel bad for Andy Reid. So part of me wants Andy Reid to win because he hasn't won the big game yet. I think he lost the Super Bowl in like 2005, I think it was. So maybe 2004. I don't know, they played the Patriots when he was with the Eagles, so whatever year it was. But, yeah, I feel bad for Andy Reid in a way because he's always been a great coach but hasn't really won a Super Bowl yet, I don't believe. So, um, yeah, I'm not, not going to be mad if the Chiefs win, obviously. I feel I, I like Mahomes for the most part. I like a lot of the Chiefs players. I mean, of course, Tyreek Hill had an off-the-field incident that I was not a fan of. But other than that, the Chiefs seem like a bunch of good guys. So, I mean, I'm happy for Mahomes if they win. But, of course, the Niners, I feel like they have a lot of momentum right now. They probably feel they can beat anybody, and I think the Chiefs have more flaws than the Niners do right now, so I'm going to go with the Niners to win this game. I would not be shocked if the Chiefs won this game by 20 points either, so I think it could happen. Anything can go either way. Um, this is like the first Super Bowl I'm excited for in a while. I mean, last year's I wasn't too excited for. I mean, the, the Rams peaked at the wrong time. I, I don't even know how they made the Super Bowl last year, but the Rams peaked at the wrong time. The Patriots were a boring team. I think two years ago we had the Eagles matchup, and, I mean, that was pretty cool because Nick Foles was like a, a big storyline and stuff like that. But, you know, this is the first Super Bowl in a couple of years where I'm like actually excited to watch. So I'm excited for this game. Hopefully it's a good one. So let me know in the comments who you think is going to win the Super Bowl, where you think some of these guys in free agency are going to sign and stuff like that. And uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed this video. So if you made it to the end, I appreciate it. And I'll talk to you next time.